Starting from nothing and looking for a place to belong, that's how Samuel Bronfman's parents arrived in Canada. Fleeing poverty and persecution in Eastern Europe, Mindel and Yechiel Bronfman came to Canada in 1889. Sam was actually born on the way. They first settled in Wapella, Saskatchewan. Their farm failed, so the Bronfmans moved to Brandon, Manitoba. Brandon was a horse trading center at the time. Sam's father and brothers would tame wild horses and then sell them at the auction. Sam made an observation at the Langham Hotel, which would change the family's fortunes forever. The way I heard the story from the father was that his father dealt in horses. And every time they concluded a deal, they'd go into the bar to have a drink and, uh, you know, shake hands. And the father's comment was that the bartender, or the, the bar, is obviously making more money on these deals than you are because they, they never lose. Odds are Sam wasn't the first family member to consider entering the liquor business. Bronfman was Yiddish for whiskey man, a term school kids tormented him with. Sam would show them by becoming the most powerful whiskey man in the world. By 1906, the Bronfman brothers were in Winnipeg and owned a few hotels, including the Bell Hotel, which Sam ran. He was a terrific pool player right up until uh, in his uh, middle 70s. And that's because the guys, there was a pool table in the back of the hotel, and they would play the owner uh, for drinks. And, you know, you could just lose all, all the profits if you weren't a very good pool player. So he really practiced. He was an excellent pool player. Prohibition became law, and contraband liquor, diluted by a nation's tears, flowed down the drain. In 1919, Prohibition was law in the U.S., and liquor distribution was taken over by bootleggers and gangsters. Taking advantage of loopholes in the Canadian law, which made it legal to export booze to the U.S., Sam set up export houses in small towns along the American border. In 1922, just before he left the prairies, Sam married Sadie Rosner. Together they started a family, and their marriage lasted a lifetime. In 1924, Sam arrived in the liquor capital of Canada, Montreal. The Bronfman brothers set up a distillery in La Salle, but Sam was in the driver's seat of the family business. Certainly when the La Salle distillery was built, he had taken the, because it was his decision to build that. Harry may have built it, but it was Dad's decision to do it, and certainly he was by now the totally dominant figure in the business. Sam now had a plant, but he wanted to make the best whiskey in the world. He went to Scotland and convinced the Scots to sample his whiskey. They approved, and he was in business with the Distillers Company Limited, the world's largest whiskey conglomerate. In the days when I first met Mr. Sam, the industry was full of characters, great characters, because these men built the industry, built their own companies, and Sam stood out amongst these great characters. Sam Bronfman had to be, in my book, one of the greatest characters I've ever met in the Scotch whisky industry. While things were going very well for Sam, he never forgot the people he met on his way to the top. Michael Leipzig recounts how Samuel Bronfman came to the aid of his grandfather's company during the height of the Depression. My family's enterprise began in 1905 when my late grandfather, Louis Leipzig, and his brother-in-law, Herman Arnovich, began a company that was in both real estate and insurance. We prospered during the, its formative years, particularly in the 1920s. And then that fateful day in 1929 came, and with it the Depression, and we found ourselves effectively flat, dead, broke. But my father, grandfather Louie, had been good friends with Sam Bronfman back in the 1920s. We had uh, undoubtedly sold him the odd hotel in Manitoba. And with no other options open to us, my grandfather got on a train and headed for Montreal. But he waited in Montreal for Sam to see him for several weeks at a time. This was two years before the end of Prohibition in the U.S. And Sam's time and capital was being turned to, I'm sure, acquiring any distilleries that he could get his hands on in the U.S. to take advantage 
of the end of prohibition. But to his everlasting credit, he lent our company in 1931, at the height of the depression, with nothing more than a promise to get it back, $100,000. And it was indeed a uh, bright day in Winnipeg when that occurred. It took us almost 20 years to repay him. But without his generosity and his kindness, our company would never have success, succeeded and lasted out the dark days of the Depression. In 1928, Sam bought out the Seagram's Distillery and a dynasty was born. In 1933, Prohibition was ended by President Roosevelt and a rush on whiskey opened up in the States. Sam wanted to release a top quality whiskey. So while his competitors were making millions, he held back, aging his whiskey to perfection. It was the single most momentous decision. It, it launched this company. It's breathtaking, really, because there are very few people who, if they had the opportunity to make that much money, wouldn't do it. I mean, and forego it on the chance that you might make more one day. I mean, uh, you know, and without a safety net, that, that, that's, that's balls. Sam's strategy paid off, and Seagram's Five Crown and Seven Crown were top sellers. Sam commissioned a building in New York by legendary architect Mies van der Rohe, and it still stands today as the Seagram's building. Sam gave back to the community in many ways. He was president of the Canadian Jewish Congress for 24 years. He received the Order of Canada, and he supported McGill University. Samuel Bronfman died in July 10th, 1971. There were so many private jets bringing in dignitaries for the funeral that the Montreal airport had to be closed to regular traffic. His legacy lives on through the dynasty he built, the family he raised, and the gifts he left his community.